Hi everyone. My name is Katherine Gray, Project Manager for MedEd. Thank you for attending Managing Stress and Compassion Fatigue during COVID-19 and Happy Nurses Week for MedEd. We hope you're all doing well and enjoying a bit of extra recognition um, during this special week. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with MedEd, we do continuing education for nurses and offer options to educate yourself for individual learning as well as your staff for group learning. So nurses are always our heroes here, and we wanted to bring you a resource that you can use in your day to day to bring some calm during this hectic time. Um, so at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Steve Allen, who's going to give you some housekeeping as far as how to ask questions and um, for those of you attending the live broadcast, how you will uh, receive your CE credit. So, Steve. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, again, my name is Steve Allen, uh, CEO of MedEd. I really pre appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to attend this um, really important subject, um, especially uh, these times. Uh, MedEd really felt that this was something that really is needed in the healthcare uh, industry in this, this standpoint. And, um, you know, I want to also say happy Nurses Week. It should be Nurses Year at this point. Um, but I really appreciate all you guys and, and what you do for, um, for everybody that's going through this COVID. Um, as far as contact hours, um, you will receive an email from MedEd uh, 20 or 48 hours after this lecture, um, and then you will be able to uh, complete an evaluation and then do your hours. If we go over a little bit, uh, if it's a little over an hour, you will get those additional uh, contact hours for, for any time that's over one hour. Um, and I really appreciate your time and want to um, also explain about the Q&A. You are muted and the camera, uh, your camera will, is off. So if you want to uh, ask any questions, um, there's a Q&A button if you mouse down to, uh, on your screen. It's a Q&A that uh, just type in any questions that you have throughout the, the lecture and uh, Mary Grace, at the end, we'll, we'll read through those questions and uh, answer those for you. So without further ado, uh, this is Mary uh, Grace Lomboy, and she's been teaching for MedEd for several, several years. She's got a lot of experience in this subject matter, and we're really excited that she's here um, teaching this, um, this lecture for us. So um, Mary Grace, you have the floor. Okay. Hi everybody, I'm Mary Grace Lomboy, nurse practitioner. I work for a hospice and community care out in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I've been in nursing for 35 years. Um, I'm a wound care specialist and also a mindfulness-based stress reduction teacher out at one of the local hospitals here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, so I've got a lot of um, experience in nursing and um, I'm also I've been teaching a lot about stress management and mindfulness training prior to this COVID-19 um, crisis that we're in right now. And I always thought it was important, but it's almost critical now to be able to take care of ourselves before we're able to take care of anyone else. So I'm just really honored to be with you, especially for Nurses Week. I've been a nurse for 35 years. Um, and it's just, um, I really appreciate MedEd, Steve and Catherine um, to reach out to me, to reach out to you. It's really important for us to take care of ourselves right now. So without further ado, let's go um, and talk about uh, stress management and compassion fatigue. So let me just get on this here. Okay. I think I got this worked out. Okay, and I'm also coming to you from my bedroom, so which is really interesting. Um, we, my husband's doing telehealth downstairs and my, my uh, son is, is working for a bank in the basement. So <laughs> here I am. So um, it's, a, it's a new time for all of us. So why are you guys here with me today? And um, you each matter, you matter so much. And healthcare is in a huge state of crisis right now with COVID-19 and I don't think it's going to be um, a sprint to the finish line here. I think it's gonna be a marathon that we're running. It's not gonna go away very quickly. Um, never has 
been a time that our workplace is as challenging as now. In the 35 years of nursing, I don't remember it ever being this difficult. Um, we are filled with lives that have uncertainty. Um, our work days are full of people in crisis. There's isolation. It's heartbreaking to see patients who can't see their families, um, especially at end of life. I'm, I'm in palliative and hospice care, and it's, it's really difficult. Um, at the end, we do, it, we do actually have one or two people come to the bedside, but it's, it's really very difficult to navigate. Self-care is as important as caring for our own clients. Um, and we have to, you know, we still have the capabilities to bring light and hope and healing to those who are suffering, but in just different ways right now. But um, we have to try to put on our oxygen mask first. I remember when my kids were little, we used to get on planes and they used to say, always put on your ma oxygen mask first before you do it for your children. I would always be like, there's no way I would ever be able to do that. But it is true, we have to show up for ourselves, we have to show up, we have to put our oxygen mask before we're able to reach out and help each other or um, our patients to the best that we can. So this is all just for you. That's, uh, I love that picture, just so happy and joyful. And then for us to be able to pay it forward to those who we care about. Um, if we show up the best that we can, it's contagious. Also, anxiety is contagious. I'm finding that. Anger is contagious. So if we show up in a gentle, um, just kind way, compassionate way, then it, it comes back to us. So an overview of the seminar is a discussion of how COVID crisis has impacted our current workplace and family, compassion fatigue versus burnout, physical and emotional consequences of increased stress, and awareness practices, some self practices that I'll teach you how to do um, right off the start here, just to start to implement through our day, and also resiliency training by beginning a self-care practice. This was a picture that I took years ago, and it was a patient that I was seeing every week for wound care, and it was just very telling to me, uh, we never know what's behind our doors of where we're going in the morning. Um, we never know what's behind the door, especially now with all the uncertainty. So how do we manage to see the, the suffering every day? There's a cost of caring, okay? How do we do that? And how do we get up in the morning and do it again, and do it again, and do it again? You know, how do we do that? That's actually me. I have a blog, um, I have a, a website called marygracemindfulness.com, and I'll give you that reference at the end. And I wrote um, a nurse's perspective. Um, that's me in full gear here without my, my um, hat on. But um, I struggled with anxiety, seeing I'm, I work on a, a positive COVID patient um, unit for one of, um, one of the nursing facilities that I, that I do wound, wound rounds in. And um, I'll tell you, it was difficult for me to connect, to feel a connection with my patients and especially those with dementia. And it was heartbreaking. I was working so hard to try to connect with them and they were terrified. There were four or five of us around the bed and um, it was very difficult for us to be able to do wound care, let alone just trying to connect with them that day. So. Um, I, I do have a blog post on some of my um, own emotions that I felt during that time, during that you know, six hour period of wound rounds at a nursing facility, and also um, you know, what the patients might have experienced and how we could connect, how we practiced a little differently that day. Um, so I will give you the link for that. So there's a cost of caring. We have stress, burnout, compassion fatigue, and they're byproducts of intense work and suffering that we see every day, every single day we wake up. There's constant change, there's heavy caseloads, there's depleted resources. Um, sometimes, you know, when, when, when we first started this COVID crisis, there was inadequate systems in place, you know, lack of PPE. And that sometimes it might trigger our own personal reactions. So when is compassion fatigue um, when does that actually occur? And it, it, it occurs with emotional fatigue and exhaustion. You know, you just can't go anymore. Repeated exposure to suffering while others, in, while, by others in a caring role. 
and it actually we start to take on that suffering it's very very different than burnout burnout is a process that involves gradual repeated exposure to job strain job strains and the erosion of idealism so it's a bur burnout is a is a it occurs when there's a chronic condition of perceived demands outweighing perceived resources. So it's not really the suffering that we take on as compassion fatigue. And it, it, burnout is a little different. It's depleted resources, how we perceive that. So the compassion fatigue is what is really critical right now. Um, warning signs in staff, exhaustion, reduced ability to feel sympathy and empathy, anger and irritability, increased use of alcohol and drugs, dreading working, seeing um, certain clients, dreading to go to work, diminished sense of employment, disruption of worldview, heightened anxiety or irrational fears. Okay, there's a whole lot of other things, absenteeism, difficult separating work life from personal life, problems with intimacy and personal relationships. I had a nurse the other day say to me, you know, um, I didn't realize how much stress I was under. I went to go and um, make myself some breakfast and I got the, the toast ready to go in the, in the toaster oven and, and I pushed the button and the, the toast was burned. And so when I saw the toast, I just freaked out. I freaked out. So what's happening there is it's the stress and the compassion fatigue is coming out sideways. Okay, it's, it's gonna come out somehow. And so we really do need to address what we're feeling, what we're, what we're experiencing, or else it's gonna come out in different ways. So compassion fatigue um, can present as physical symptoms, like headache, digestive issues, muscle tension, sleep disturbances, exhaustion, cardiac cyst symptoms, depression, or other stress-related illnesses like PTSD. All the other ones too at the bottom there, despair, um, lack of empathy, depression, memory, you know, all that mental health stuff. And also abuse of drugs or alcohol. I love this slide um, and I always use this in my presentations that Mother Teresa understood compassion fatigue. She recognized the effects. She actually wrote in her own plan of care that it was mandatory for her superiors or to her nuns, um, for her nuns to take a, an entire year off from their duties every four to five years to allow them to heal, okay, from their effects of caregiving work. So I'm thinking like I've worked probably about 35 years. I've got lots of years to take off. <laughs> just kidding. I'm not going anywhere. I'm just, I'm just saying. But she totally recognized the effects. Stress is different too. So the definition of stress is a particular transaction between a person and an environment that's appraised by the person as taxing or exceeding whose resources or endangering his or her well-being. So it's very subjective. What might be stressful for me might be a walk in the park for you. So um, it's very much how we're perceiving our environment and the stimulus that's coming in. Causes of stress, there's external causes, family work, economics, school, major life changes. Um, my daughter got married three years ago and that was a major life stress. It was a good thing, but it was stressful. And then there's the internal worries, um, the, the uncertainty that we're living with right now, the fears, attitudes, unrealistic expectations. And then this COVID-19 added a whole other layer of stress and uncertainty to our lives that we'll talk about in a bit. Oh, here it is. So um, the anxiety um, could be about like when I go to the grocery store, when I don't see like all this, the supplies there, when I see that there's no meat in the meat section, I think there's a little buzz that starts in me. There's a little bit of anxiety, um, you know, no toilet paper. I'm not sure what happened to all the toilet paper. There isn't any um, paper towels, things like that. Going to the grocery store is anxiety for me. Um, not knowing what the other person is going to do, you know, if they're, if they're not wearing their masks or if they're not, you know, doing the whole social distancing. I've seen a lot of anger outbursts in the grocery store between um, people. Um, so you just don't know. It's the uncertainty of what is this interaction going to be like? And does that cause you anxiety? Fear of infecting loved ones. You know, when I'm on a positive COVID unit, 
it's like, oh my gosh, my son is at home. My husband's at home. Um, I'm scared to death. I'm going to infect them when I come home. So I strip in the garage, run right up to the shower. Um, you know, so, and also our own mortality, you know, we could get infected, you know, we could get infected. Difficulty planning for an uncertain future. We have no idea what tomorrow's going to bring, you know. Um, there was a PPE shortage. We're still reusing, you know, our N95 masks. Financial insecurity. So many businesses are hurting right now. Um, child care, elder care issues, isolation, quarantining, social distancing. My own mom, who's 84 years old, has been in isolation now. She, she's counting. She keeps telling me every day, this is day 61. Um, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. She's living by herself and just trying to manage. Um, and it's, it's really difficult. We go and see her and we have a glass, you know, right between the glass, um, dropping off some food to her whenever we can. Um, loss of social and religious communal practices, you know, that layer of community is gone. And then for me, a huge thing was adapting to new technologies, you know, to the Zoom meetings um, and telehealth. So that's all a huge learning curve for me and for others. But it's, our, it's, our, it's how we are able to communicate and connect with each other now. But also some good things. Um, communities coming together in virtual formats. Um, colleagues, friends, loved ones offering support to each other. Yesterday was my husband's 60th birthday and we went outside and there was 15 cars coming by, blowing their horns, waving signs, happy birthday to him. It was, it really moved us a lot. Um, it was like, wow, this is beautiful. It's really beautiful. So there's still some beauty in, in all this. Strong teamwork and facing challenges, um, learning how to do new things, new ways, um, successfully adapting to new platforms and feeling good about it, feeling a, a little element of success here. Increased respect for healthcare workers. The nurses are on the map now, guys. It's pretty amazing. Um, it's, it's really, it's, it's really amazing the, uh, the beautiful outpouring of support that we have now as nurses. And, um, and, and it's finally here that we're given the permission to, for ourselves to discover a, a capacity for coping and resiliency training. Um, a lot of facilities are reaching out to me right now saying like, we need, we need help learning how to do this. Um, whereas before, I always felt like I was kind of pushing it on people. Now it's, it's time to like really zoom in and figure out how to practice resiliency. And it's the only way we're going to get through this. It's the only way we're going to be able to cope efficiency, efficient, efficiently to be able to show up for our patients. So there's also what I see problem versus opportunity. So the problems are the moral distress, compassion, fatigue, depression, anxiety, PTSD, like we talked about. But there's an opportunity here for resiliency, for transformational growth, for self-care, not traditionally seen as a value for us. It really isn't. It was a soft thing that we did and we talked about, but we really didn't practice it. Um, but self-care, again, is more important than ever to protect against short-term and long-term negative effects um, for mental health and for physical health. And also, there's a thing called self-compassion that we're going to talk a little bit about today. So some of the things I can control, I can control my attitude, okay, how I show up. I can control, control how much I sleep, how much news I watch. My daily physical activity, I've been really trying to walk every day and that's made a huge difference, just getting out into nature, seeing um, nature arise, you know, spring blooming into um, the present moment, which is like just amazing. Um, nature has really great timing with, with all this whole COVID-19 thing um, where we're able to just watch nature just, just bloom. Um, my own gratitude. Um, and eating well, trying to eat well, trying to not eat as much sugar as I really, my, my body craves, really trying to, everything in moderation, following the CDC guidelines with social distancing, my own personal distance, and how much social media I'm, I'm actually taking in. We can't predict the future. We can't control that. We can't say how long this is going to last, or actions of other people, or other people stockpiling things, or other people's thoughts and motives, 
So these are things that we cannot control and we just need to kind of let it be. So coming into this automatic, um, autonomic nervic, nervous system um, with the two different systems, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system, um, this fight or flight, when we have anxiety in our body, the sympathetic nervous system is activated, okay? And the parasympathetic is responsible for er energy conservation and relaxation, and it is not able to engage when we are so revved up in this fight or flight. And we'll talk a little bit about this. It's like our brains are still reacting as if we're running from a saber-toothed tiger or running out of a burning building. It's like trying to save our lives. The adrenaline and the cortisol is pumping. And so we are truly reacting like stress to stress as if our lives are on the line. And we don't realize that um, our body is still reacting like that because our mind can't shut off. Okay, so it results in faster heart rate, elevated blood pressure, respirations, affected digestion, and weakened immune system. So it really does help to notice where we feel stress in our body, where we feel it coming on. And that's part of the awareness practice that I'm gonna tell you about. The effects of stress on the body are a lot. Um, you, can, you can read that, I'm not gonna read that slide to you, but the, you know, it, it, it affects everything, um, every single, um, system in the body is affected. And so the body responds to stress in three, one, one of three ways. So it sets the alarm off. That's when we start to feel the stress in our body. And then we can resist it up to a certain point. And then it just goes into exhaustion and recovery. And then the cycle begins again, or we go right into illness. And that's, um, you know, kind of where we, we just, we, there's no, there's no turning back that point. So we really do have to kind of see when, we, when the alarm bell is ringing and not ignore it and deal with that stress before we hit resistance and exhaustion or illness. So we have an opportunity here to know what our warning signs are. To kind of have the stress scale from like zero to 10, what's a four for me? And then what's a nine? So I teach nurses about this mindful check-in and we'll do that um, together today. You know, it basically shows like, how am I doing or what does my body need right now? We have a way of just ignoring what our body needs. Um, what things do I have control over or no control over? And also what stress relief activities can I institute every day? So just let the good in. So again, if you learn absolutely nothing from me today, um, the mindful check-in is really, really important. And it literally takes maybe 30 seconds. So let's do that today, right now. So let's sit up nice and tall, wherever you're at. And we're just gonna do a mindful check-in together. So sitting nice and straight, kind of in a meditative um, position. You could either be sitting on a cushion, or sitting in a chair or even standing up is fine. So just uh, if you feel comfortable, just closing your eyes or looking down at the floor and feeling your feet on the floor and just coming here together and arriving here in this space, feeling your body supported by the chair or a cushion and just noticing our thoughts right now. Is our mind busy? Is it moving really fast? And what thoughts might be having our mind be occupied with today? What's pulling us in different directions? And just keeping that center stage right now, like what's going on here for me today in this moment? And just watching and noticing. And then shifting our attention from our thoughts to any emotions we're having right now. What's coming up for us right now? Is there anxiety? Is there sadness? Is there joy or excitement? What's here right now? The many layers of emotions that we might be feeling and being okay with whatever is coming up for you. Letting that or those emotions 
be named right here silently to yourself. You know, this is anxiety or this is sadness or this is frustration or this is joy, whatever that might be. And having that flow through your body and being okay with whatever is here right now instead of resisting it, just letting it be as it is. Having it pass through your body and then shifting your attention to your breath, feeling the body breathe. I like to call the breath home base. Breathing in and breathing out. Feeling tension dissolve with every exhale. Maybe breathing in for four and a nice big sigh for eight. Just letting all the tension go. And maybe feeling a shift here. Just noticing any shifts, any feelings of anxiety, leaving the body. And then gently feeling your feet once again on the floor, your body supported by the chair and feeling the presence of others in the Zoom call again. And then slowly opening your eyes, coming back into the call. So that mindful check-in um, is something that you can do any time of the day. Um, it's easy, it's as simple as one, two, three. It can um, just basically scans the internal weather of your body. How am I showing up? How am I, what am I bringing to work today? What am I bringing here? What am I bringing home from work? Maybe even doing this before we even enter our house after we come home from work. So it's just checking in with yourself and finding out what do you need? What do you need in this moment? So this is really important. This is a great thing to do even when we're washing our hands. What do we do in between patients? We're washing our hands constantly right now. So doing a mindful check-in at the wash sink um, while we're washing our hands. You know, how am I showing up? You know, instead of being an automatic pilot of what's happening, or what's not happening, coming back to yourself, okay? What are my thoughts? What are my emotions? What am I carrying with me? What do I need right now? So it's really easy, really easy to get to. So there's a lot of different formal practices um, that we could do for mindfulness practices. Um, and there's also some informal practices, like easy things that we could access every day, like taking a shower, um, making sure you're present for the shower instead of planning or being in the past or the future, are we actually feeling the water on our bodies? Are we feeling the scent of, um, are, we, are we noticing the scent of the soap? Are we feeling the bubbles in our hair? You know, are we feeling our feet on the floor? Walking from your car to your home or workplace could be a walking meditation, feeling each step, noticing what's blooming outside, feeling the wind, seeing the beautiful blue sky, little things like that. Um, doing chores such as washing the dishes, bringing awareness to the scent of the soap, watching the bubbles, hearing the water flow from the faucet. These are little practices that bring us back into the present moment, okay? And again, wa washing your hands in between patients is another way to anchor and ground us into the present moment. So pick one thing to do every day. And if you do something for 21 days, it's noted that it becomes then a habit. So just pick one thing every day just to do, um, even driving. Sometimes I get from point A to point B and I don't remember even how I got there. So you can add an awareness training to driving. So things like that. And it really brings us less anxiety, brings us back into the moment. So it, it develops our attention muscle okay, gets us out of autopilot, recognizes thoughts and emotions, bodily sensations, has an element of self-compassion and kindness. 
non-judgmental attitude. Okay, we're not, this is not the time to be self-critical. It's really a time to be gentle with ourselves. And it actually encourages an approach mode rather than avoidance. So I'm asking you through that mindful check-in, what emotion are you feeling right now? And lean into it, okay? I know it, it sounds kind of crazy, it's a little counterintuitive, but leaning into it actually has us address what's happening in our body and, and has it pass through us and deal with it in a little bit more of an easier um, way instead of keep pushing it down, pushing it down, because it's gonna come back. It's gonna come back and even in a greater, in a greater vengeance. So another thing that we teach in mindfulness practice is the stop practice. So it's kind of the same thing, only a little different. So whenever we start to feel alarmed, reactive, stressed out, when we start to feel stress build in our body, wherever that might be, some people feel it in their necks, some people feel it on their chest, in their tummy. Um, it really just depends, it's very unique. And if you guys were with me right now, I could be asking you this, but just ask yourself, where do you feel stress in your body? And so when you start to feel it, stop. Stop whatever you're doing and pause. Set whatever down, look away, disengage. Come back to your breath. That breath is your home base. Take a breath, feel a couple cycles of breath, okay? And actually engaging the breath, increase it, increasing the exhale actually helps to activate the parasympathetic nervous system. So maybe inhaling for four and exhaling for eight is a really good way to cause the parasympathetic nervous system to take over, all right? Gets us out of that fight or flight. So after we take a breath, we observe. What's center stage here? What's happening, okay? What are our thoughts? What are our emotions? What bodily sensations are we having right now? And just a sense of curiosity, kind of be an observer of that, okay? Let it pass through. Okay, like clouds in the sky that just keep moving and then proceed with a good intention, like with good intention that you feel like you're coming from a place that is a little bit more grounded and less reactive. So we could respond versus react. Okay, so that's the stop practice. So we could use the stop technique anytime we feel activated, anytime um, we wash our hands, we can use it as a reset button, okay? It really, the pause makes the difference. We learn to respond again, like I said earlier, rather than react. And it, it, in this whole, everything that I'm teaching you right now is just creating space. It creates space between that stimulus that's coming at us and how we're we gonna react. It gives us a little opportunity to have space, to breathe, and a little bit more clarity in our approach to things. So when we do have difficult emotions, um, we want to be able to perceive it, perceive that emotion and allow it to happen, to name it. I said earlier, name it, to tame it. It gives it less, um, it, it gives it less, um, how do I wanna say this? It gives it less um, stress in our body. It gives it less strength in our body, okay, when we actually name it. This is anxiety. This is fear. This is frustration. Okay, when we name it, it gives it less power. That's the word I was looking for. Excuse me on that one. It gives it less power over our body. So when we name something, it goes through our body and it already cuts it off at the knees, okay? And it takes, take whatever is useful from it. Let it move through your body, recognize it. Here it is, here it is again. It's taken center stage and then let it go. Place a hand on your heart, okay? This is another thing that we could do for self-compassion and say, this is what I'm feeling right now. This is difficult right now. Again, compassion and kindness for ourselves. So another check-in is our attitude. How do we, um, how would we feel um, if we were really, really self-critical to our best friend, okay? So the question that I have for you is if your friend was really having a bad day, what would it be like for you to comfort your best friend who is having a bad day? You wouldn't be critical of them. You would say, it's okay. This is hard right now. 
okay? So I'm asking you, what would it be like if you were your own best friend? So practicing kindness and compassion and being gentle with yourself. Now's not the time to be self-critical, not, not under all the stress that we're under right now, okay? And non-judgment, we have an idea of how things should be, okay? Comparing our work and our life situation pre-COVID-19. And that's hard, it's really hard. Um, seeking perfectionism. So we have to develop skills to be with how things are right now, okay? And working on acceptance, acceptance of those, of those things as they are, because the more we resist what's happening, um, the more we suffer. So there's, there's a definite um, link to resistance to whatever's happening and more suffering. This is something that I think is really important that I like to teach um, the nurses when I give this talk is setting a daily intention. This is um, the opposite of reactivity, okay? So when we set a daily intention, like my intention today is to be the best listener I can for patients or to check in with myself before each patient. It basically sets, um, it opens up possibilities to plant a seed for the day. And it, it basically inclines the mind, shapes our words and our thoughts for what could be for that day, rather than waking up and saying, oh my gosh, I'm gonna have the crappiest day ever. Who's gonna have a better day? when I say I'm gonna have the crappiest day ever, or my intention today is to check in with myself before each patient and maybe have a plan for self-care. So my schedule might be like a crappy schedule. There's days that I drive 115 patients to see three patients. But in between those times, I can listen to a podcast. I can go to Dairy Queen and get myself a, a chocolate ice cream. I can call a friend in between patients. I could um, sit under a tree and have a, a, you know, a piece of fruit in between patients just as a self-care um, kind of thing before I go to the next patient. So um, we have the power to choose what our daily intention is. And it is really pretty powerful if we, um, if we have that and we open to the possibilities of what that is. So the power again of the pause. The pause, take a breath observe and proceed. There's another practice that I'd like um, to teach you how to calm your nervous system down. And it's called four square breathing. So everybody get their finger and we're just gonna draw a square in the air, okay? And we're gonna stop at the bottom left-hand corner of the square. We're gonna look at our finger and I'm gonna talk you through this, okay? So we're gonna inhale for four one, two, three, four, pause, two, three, four, exhale down, two, three, four, pause again, hold your breath, two, three, four, inhale up, one, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, exhale down, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four. Four. Another time, one, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, exhale down, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four. Last time, inhale up, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, exhale down, two, three, four, and hold, two, three, four. So um, you can do that anytime to get yourself out of like a revved up nervous system, okay? Or negative self-talk or overwhelmed by emotions and stress. It's a really great reset button or uh, when trying to sleep. Um, so you can do that whenever um, you feel like you need more clarity or you have to stop rumination of like negative thoughts. Just do four rounds of four square breathing. And um, I'm anxious to see if anybody has any comments at the end of this 
Um, I wish I could ask you questions, but I guess we'll wait till the last part of this um, to be able to see what what your experience was with af after some of these practices. So be sure to like kind of jot them down and you can share that. So that's basically it. Um, I actually teach our patients this. I see patients for anxiety in palliative care and they're able to do this. I write this on a little piece of paper and they're able to trace it with their fingers. Even my end-stage COPD patients are able to do this, usually after they take um, like an inhaler or something like a breathing treatment, um, but they're able to do that and, and really calm their nervous system. I've seen where patients are taking less um, meds for anxiety, less Ativan, less morphine um, when they're doing some of these breathing practices. It's really interesting. So the key to resilience is self-care. Without self-care, we get burnout, compassion, fatigue. We are a culture that says we're fine, right? We're fine. We've, we've got this. We don't need anything. We, we're, we're fine. But we also need to recognize our own limitations with compassion. We're the doers, okay? We need to sometimes pause, step back, and ask, what is my body telling me? Sometimes we don't listen to our bodies until it's screaming out in pain, and then it's like, oh, darn, I should have listened. Okay, it's habitually easy to override warning signs. So please start listening to your body and doing the pauses in between. Transitions from work to home is really important. Um, we've got to figure out ways to bring closure to your work day or else we're carrying all that stress right into our family life, right into our home. So um, develop rituals to be able to shift gears. Um, changing clothes, you know, right now I'm stripping in the garage and running all the way up through the house and getting in the shower, putting on my yoga pants and I'm set. Um, I love to go outside, I can live outside. Um, taking a walk, taking the dog out, you know, throwing a tennis ball to the dog, um, you know, having just some, some downtime, like just zoning out sometimes in front of a TV and just watching a 30 minute office, you know, just something brainless that just kind of just gives me some freedom just to relax. Okay. So um, some self-care ideas. Maybe calling a time out as a way of dealing with emotional flooding after a traumatic event. The other day I went to go see, um, I went to go do wound rounds in one of the nursing facilities. I was supposed to see four patients and two of them had died already just from last week. So um, I needed to stop practice right then and there. I was just like, okay, I just need to kind of regroup, you know, feel my feet on the floor, um, feel my, my body, where I'm at, come back to my breath, take a couple of breaths here. You know, I'm okay. I, you know, this is hard for me right now. Um, I need to make sure I'm okay before I go on and proceed. This is sad, it's just sad, sadness. Um, setting a watch or a phone alarm. Um, my, I have a Calm app, which is free. So my phone um, at eight o'clock and at 12 o'clock, it just asks me, how are you? You know, what are you doing right now? How, how are you showing up kind of thing? Um, and it just is another way for another mindful check-in. So I have it set at eight o'clock in the morning and 12 o'clock in, in the afternoon and one um, in the evening, right before I go to bed. So you can do that. Calm app is free. All parts of it are free. So that part is free. Um, before entering a patient's room, take a few breaths, just, you know, just, you know, calm yourself. Um, feel the, the feet, you know, moving through the hallway of the patient's hallway, feeling your feet on the ground, a small little walking meditation when you're moving towards um, another patient's room. Um, there's a lot of different grounding techniques. Um, so real quick, we're going to do the five senses one. I have this here. So um, right now, Find five things that you can see around you, okay? Five things, just notice in the room, five things that you can see, okay? Four things you can touch, maybe feeling clothing on your body, maybe um, sitting in a chair, feeling your feet on the ground, feeling your socks on your feet or your shoes on your feet, anything that you can touch. Three things you can hear, okay? It might be my voice. It might, I hear an airplane outside. I hear my son downstairs. 
just different things you can hear. Two things you can smell. Not sure if you can smell anything where you're at, but um, even using essential oils here is a, a kind of a nice grounding um, practice. And one thing that you can taste. So if you have like um, a mint or something like that, you can place that in your hand, in your mouth. So that's using five senses to ground. That's the five, four, three, two, one method. Your feet are really grounding tools. Use them, feeling your feet on the floor, holding an object in your hand. Sometimes people like to use rocks or stones or um, anything, even a spiritual thing that you have a, a deep connection to, having that in your pocket. Um, the four square breathing is grounding. Um, just stretching, um, breathing into, you know, just leaning up, breathing up and then exhaling down, you know, just taking a nice big breath, inhale up, looking up to the sky and exhaling down, just breathing um, and stretching. Holding an ice cube or smelling an essential oil brings us back, grounds us back. Talking or reading out loud, you know, just um, get a book and start reading out loud brings us back. Taking a mental inventory of everything around you, looking at colors, patterns that you see, sounds that you hear. Again, just hooking into the senses. Um, and then also taking 10 slow deep breaths, using the breath as an anchor, maybe putting your hand on your heart and just coming back to your breath, back to home base. And then there's something called four, seven, eight breathing that um, I'd like to share with you right now too, which is um, Dr. Andrew Wiles from um, he's in the integrative um, de health department of the University of Arizona. He, um, he developed this and it's four, seven, eight breathing. So I will count it out with you. You're gonna inhale for four counts, hold for seven and exhale for eight. And if the hold is too difficult for you to hold, you can just inhale for four and exhale down for eight. Okay, but we will try the four, seven, eight breathing. So inhale up, one, two, three, four, hold, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, exhale out, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Inhale up, one, two, three, four, hold, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, exhale. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so that's four, seven, eight breaths. And I usually tell people not to do more than four of those, okay? Totally activates the parasympathetic nervous system. It's another great tool for you to use, use it throughout the day. So again, steps to self-compassion. Um, we need to put our oxygen masks on first before we can try to help out anybody else. We need to bring order to the chaos that we're, um, that we're experiencing right now. We need a place of refuge, a time to rest. So self-compassion, the components of that, um, mindfulness actually notices the suffering of others, okay? with an element of compassion and kindness, care and understanding, and a common humanity. Everybody is feeling this, you know, a sense of suffering right now, a sense of grief, a sense of loss, feeling connected with others in this experience of life, okay? It's, it's common humanity. We're all feeling it right now, rather than feeling isolated by our suffering, okay? Seeing the larger human experience, and that's really powerful to know that you're not suffering alone. So there's another, um, another exercise here called RAIN of mindful self-compassion, and that's recognizing. Notice what's happening. A level of acceptance saying yes, making room for the experience. This is difficult right now. This, let it in, let, let in whatever is happening right now investigate, be curious, okay? Um, not judgmental about it. Oh, I shouldn't be feeling this. This shouldn't be happening. But okay, it's happening. Let's accept this. 
And let's see how my body feels when I'm experiencing this right now. A level of curiosity and kindness. Non-identification, becoming a witness to the experience, kind of taking you know, a little space between what's happening and the way you're perceiving it to be happening. So stepping back a little bit, okay? And then compassion, maintaining an attitude of kindliness and friendliness and gentleness towards yourself and to others. There's also another short practice called 20 breaths. And we're not gonna do this together today, but um, you can Google it and it's 20 breaths. Each breath is a fresh one. And you just use your hands to go all the way up to 10 and all the way back down to 20. And just not changing the flow of your breath, just really making it just flow easily. Um, not worrying about the last breath, not worrying about the next breath, just being present with each breath. This is great for when you wake up in the morning at three o'clock in the morning, like I do sometimes, and can't fall back to sleep. I'll do 20 breaths. And sometimes they get to 14 or 15 and I just fall asleep. Sometimes they get to 60 and then I fall asleep. So it's a great way just to settle down the nervous system called 20 breaths. Um, there's another practice that I'd like to share with you um, before we end this. And this is um, from, it was developed, it's a process developed by Joan Halifax. Um, and she um, actually is, is a, an amazing um, mindfulness person who talks about end of life a lot. And she's uh, remarkable. I've read all of her books and I would love to be able to train with her someday. She is um, out in the Santa Fe area. And it's basically um, aiding the clinician to cultivate compassion during the interaction with a patient. And it's Grace, which I love because my name is Mary Grace, but anyway. That's beside the point. But anyway, so G is gathering attention. So again, we've talked so much about grounding yourself. So before you even see a patient, gather your attention, grounding yourself. And I gave you some tools to ground. Pause, breathe in, give yourself time to get grounded. Focus on your breath, that home base. Maybe do four, seven, eight breath, or um, just you know the 20 breath practice. Or just maybe the, you know, just coming back to your breath, saying this is difficult right now. Maybe a little self-compassion. Feeling the soles of your feet on the floor. R is recall your intention. Okay, remember that intention that we started in the morning practice? Setting an intention for yourself. Remember why you're there. Why are you there? And that's really to relieve the, indig the individual suffering and to act with as much integrity as you can. You know, um, our motivation for why we're there keeps us on track, keeps us moving forward, keeps us doing the right thing for the patients, helps us to connect as hard as it is right now. A is a tune. How am I showing up? You know, that mindful check-in. Notice what's going on in our mind and our body. Sense into the experience of your patient. What might they be experiencing right now, okay? Um, what I found was they were scared. They were scared, they were, they were you know, my, my patients were scared because they have dementia and we had four or five people around their bed in full PPE and they had no idea who we were or what we were doing. So their experience that at that point was really fear. It was fear. So trying to um, you know how am I showing up and what are they experiencing? And we have to kind of bridge that gap. Okay, um, it might include what the patient's saying, emotional cues, voice tones, body language. And a lot of our patients are deaf and they can't even hear us and we have face masks on. So we have to be really patient and trying to communicate um, you know, with what we're trying to say, what we're trying to explain to them and just give them the time to respond. Consider what will serve in the present moment here, drawing on our own expertise, our knowledge, our experience. We, we have the experience, we have it. And to be open to seeing things in a fresh new way. What can I do to serve? 
Okay, there may not be enough resources now, or maybe we feel like our hands are tied behind our backs, but there's things that we could still do. There are some things we could still do. And engage, moving from considering to enacting, morally and compassionately, okay? Going from a place of mutual trust and morally grounded, and then consistent with our values, just engage and enact however we're supposed to act in that, in that continuous um, you know, movement from engaging into ending the visit, okay? So ending the visit, letting it go, taking a breath, and acknowledge your good work, okay? Um, I think we could beat ourselves up, you know, oh gosh, that wasn't good, it wasn't, it, I, you know, I didn't connect as well as I could have, but I think we just need to be um, kind to ourselves and acknowledge that we're doing the best that we can with what we're doing right now. Um, also, the value of alone time. I know we're all crammed in our houses and you know, we're working together. We might be homeschooling our children. Um, but I retreat to taking a bath or a hot shower every day for 15 minutes and I just turn it, turn everything off that's happening and I'm just in that shower. Um, solitude can be a much desired condition in the silence we listen to ourselves and in the quietude we might even hear the voice of God. It's Maya Angelou. I love that. And also movement, um, you know, helps with mood, endorphin, serotonin. Um, walking is great, going outside. I've been doing a lot of that lately. Also, um, looking at um, the negativity bias of our brains. So there's a researcher by the name of Dr. Rich Hansen. Um, what the mind attends to, the brain becomes. Our brain is like Velcro for those negative experiences. We hang on to them and like Teflon for the positive. You can Google Dr. Rich Hansen. Um, but really, we need to take the good in. Okay, um, we can re reprogram our brain, neuroplasticity, carve out new ways of thinking, and the way we do that is adding gratitude. Tons of gratitude um, studies have been done. Um, gratitude acts as a natural antidepressant. If we journal three things daily, the natural circuits are activated, like the dopamine and serotonin, the same neurotransmitter transmitters that follow the natural um, bliss centers of the brain similar to the antidepressant mechanisms of action. So the neurons that fire together basically wire together. The more you practice this, the more it stimulates. And I love to do this practice. Actually, we're doing this as a family. We have like a little GLAD technique, um, uh, little journal downstairs. And every day since we've started this whole quarantine thing, my son is here with us. We do um, the GLAD technique, and I've been doing this with a lot of depressed patients lately too. So G is for gratitude. One thing you're grateful for today, and just write it down. L is one thing that you learned today, something about yourself, a new fact, a new insight, it could be anything. And this is all within the day. A is for something you accomplished, one small accomplishment you did today. It could be an ordinary act of self-care, like getting enough sleep or not missing a meal. I had a patient tell me one time she just had a CVA and she's like, well, I put my own pants on today. It took me 45 minutes, but it was a huge accomplishment. So it's little things like that. And one delight, one thing that brought you joy or happiness that you experienced today, like noticing a thing of beauty, hearing a bird chirp or a flower blooming. And then you date it and then you just keep writing the GLAD technique um, this is beautiful too for people that are end of life because it's like a little journal that they keep for their family after they pass away. And I've had families say, wow, you know, I got to know what dad was thinking through the last days of his life. Um, so it's a really beautiful thing to be able to share with your patients too. This is my website, marygracemindfulness.com. Um, there's free audio um, meditations on there and there's a blog post that there's the blog post that I mentioned the nurse's perspective on there and a few other things there's a lot of resources on there and um, I'm also able to receive emails through that blog um, through the uh, website so feel free to access that marygracemindfulness.com 
Um, and this is from uh, Med, Med Ed. And if you have any additional questions on, you know, for this webinar, you can contact them. I thank you so much for um, joining me today. It's an honor to really be able to have this time with you. Um, I'm just so in awe of all the nurses and how they're just rising to the occasion and um, take care of, you know, of patients right now, but um, really trying to take care of themselves. So I really appreciate you being here. Um, and so I'm going to stop sharing right now. And if you have any questions or comments, I'm, they're telling me I could see it in the Q&A. So I don't see any open questions. If anybody has anything that they would like to ask or comment, now's the time. No, I don't see anything. So, oh, oh, it says excellent. Thank you from Dottie. Thank you, Dottie. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else have anything? Okay, I guess not. All right. Well, um, I thank you again for sharing your time with me and uh, wishing you blessings for all the work that you do. Um, just, just keep up the good work. Thank you. Oh, wait a minute. I do have, okay. I have a couple, <laughs> four more things just came in. Thanks for all you shared. Well done and greatly appreciate it. And thank you all. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. I guess no one has any questions. So I think I will end right now. Okay. Thanks again. Bye.